Hello, Harry. Hello, Matt. How are you? Oh my God, I'm really excited at seeing you. <laughs> Me too. Where are you? I'm in Berlin at the moment, and uh, okay. yeah, you you are still up there in upstate New York. Yes, I am. I live here. Yes, and I'm a co-founder of an organization called the Gay Coaches Alliance. It's an international organization of gay coaches. I appreciate you for uh, bringing this amazing game into the world. And uh, it has been changing my life. It has been changing the life of many others that you probably don't really know of how many people you have uh, impacted with this dynamic. So, so how much do you actually know you have impacted with this game in the world? Well, I only know this from uh, you and Betty Martin. Yeah. So I, I did this thing uh, years ago and it seemed to disappear and nothing happened. And then it was being used by several teachers I trained at the Body Electric School. And I, I was just surprised when suddenly there was an interest, first of all, from Betty Martin and then uh, you, from you. How did you found it and how did you develop it? And what's the roots? Where did it came from and how did you brought that together? Okay, so it needs to be seen in the context. I did it and I didn't really think, didn't plot it out or something like that. I just did it one day, I did it. And the way that happened was I was in uh, early recovery from alcoholism, maybe about three or four years. And I was uh, a, a follower in AA and I did the work called 12 Steps that we were asked to do. And the important, most important part of this work is developing a relationship with God or with a higher power, whatever that might mean to each individual. And at the same time, I was also working as an instructor at the Body Electric School uh, in California. And I was teaching, I was asked to teach a workshop on BDSM. And uh, in that workshop, you need to be able to ask for what you need or want or desire or fantasize about. And nobody knew how to could do that. And personally, I couldn't do that in my own private life. And I, 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 I racked my brain. I brought the best of my intelligence to this situation. And uh, the, the, I, in my mind, I was inter more interested in S&M than in my practical life. So this was also happening. And I was interested in the word power and in the word surrender. And how can we do this? Because in, in these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, one of them is to turn my life and will over to a power greater than me. Intellectually, people talk about this endlessly. It's an interesting conversation. But I was trying to figure out physically, what would that be like? What would I experience if I turned my will and my life over to you? What would that be like? What would you be like? What would I be like? And I was reading also Rumi. And Rumi has, I've been a student of his for 30 years. He has this quote that everybody uses now. You must ask for what you really want. It's so simple. And still we have the experience of asking for somebody what they want. What would you like to have for dinner tonight? And you'll say, I don't know, what would you like? Why don't you just tell me what you want? Why can't that be clear? It's not uh, conducive to strong uh, intimacy unless you decide something. And one day it just came to me. I was sitting there and I was thinking, how can I get these people to do these things? And without doing them just because I tell them to do something in a workshop. And it just came to me and that it is so simple that it's beyond 
my belief. And I want to say in another way, what is the big fuss about this? Well, it's a very simple thing. There are four questions or something, whatever that is. Mm. Tell me what you want. And then I thought, oh, I, how I tell you is either <clears throat> by doing or saying, I want you to tell me something. Tell me, tell me you love me. That's what I want. Mm. Tell me you, tell me you need me. Tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me, tell me I'm an idiot. I don't know, whatever. Tell me something about myself that I want to hear. Mm. Right? You may, you may not want to hear me say I love you. So if I say I love you a hundred times, uh, it may not register with you. But if I tell you I love you sometimes, oh, that might get your attention because that's what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. You don't want to hear me say, I love you all the time. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it all depends on what is in here. There's nothing to do. There's no outside book to read. There's no, nothing you have to wear. Two people sitting in front of each other. And it may be that you want to do nothing. And it, because you want to do neck rubbing doesn't mean you always want to do neck rubbing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do I allow you to change from one minute to the next day something? Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of contexts and it's so easy that anybody can do it. Whatever, whatever our, our awareness is of sexuality or general living, this can be used for general living. In, in relationship, in community, in engagement with family, colleagues, strangers even. And this is, in my perception, why it is so universal and so tremendously transformative because it is so freaking simple. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about the dynamics of power and in a spiritual realm and what your experience of that is and if there is some um, difficulties, obstacles, what were the um, traps where people went into when they played it? Well, the first trap is the theology. So this is not about theology, whether or not there's a God. Yeah. That's another discussion. This is about your relationship with whatever you believe is a higher power. So if I say it's easy to say God, all right? And there's one thing we know about, if we know, agree, can have the concept of God, that we are made in God's likeness. We sh there's a God inside. Mostly, most people would agree to this, whatever you call it. It could be Christ or whatever. So we share the divine attribute of power, whether we're men or women. And when it comes down to earth, the conversation is different between men and between women, because there are people who believe that power is a part of our male part and, and surrender is female. I don't, uh, I don't agree with that construct. Mm -hmm. Women have power in the same way that men have power. So how can I surrender my will? How can I do that? So I thought it, it came to me, if I'm kneeling down in front of you, I can surrender. I have that experience. It isn't even really describable. <laughs> I'm on my knees and you're not. You're standing up. I'm looking up at you. And there's going to be a conversation. Even if it's nonverbal, there's going to be a conversation that I want something. <laughs> Or from up there, what do you want? Why are you kneeling there? I need, I want. Then there are those adverbs. I am kneeling here. I can tell you what I've always wanted. This is the whole thing of my life, what I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted somebody to something. We all have this yearning that we've never gotten filled, more than likely. So from the viewpoint of the person surrendering, there are those statements or needs or wants. Now, what happens from the person standing? 
looking down at this human being whose life is in your hands, especially if you've been tied up, say that you're, you're bound, your hands are bound, and you are in this state. What kind of God am I going to be? I have this power, and if I don't use it, you're not going to be, you're going to be disappointed if I pretend I don't have it. So if I can rise up to that occasion, I can be God for you for an hour or five minutes. I'm told in India, some places have this custom that if I'm in deep distress, I can come to you and ask you to be God for me for 10 minutes and you will do that. I, my problem is too big. I can't talk to Matthias. I need to speak to God. Hmm. Then only then can I trust. I can't trust humans. I can't trust you, but I can trust God. Some, some things are so enormous that they require this interaction. It's not handled on the earthly plane. It could be forgiveness, guilt, uh, sadness, uh, grief, all of these things. So I realized when I first created that workshop, it was called Power and Surrender. And I was missing something and I didn't know what it was. But I discovered it when I was conducting a spanking workshop. And in that workshop, each person was A or B, a giver or receiver, and you had to do both. Many people only like to do one, but in this workshop, you had to learn how to do both, to have that experience. And two people came out of that temple and they said, I had no idea that spanking had anything to do with intimacy. And the light went off. And I thought, this is what happens when two people do this exercise of power and surrender, that they develop a relationship, hmm. a deep relationship that is almost hard to talk about, the closeness that we feel with somebody. And it, it is possible for two human beings to feel this without any hooks. I'm not gonna be your boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm, I had this intimacy with you. This is what it means when we're all walking around with God inside. Why We can experience this from each other all the time. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to be starved for intimacy, from intimacy or, mm -hmm. or without intimacy. Mm -hmm. We should be thriving on the love of God from each of us. So what would you say after more than 20 years of playing it and practicing it and teaching it to people, what would be the a change or a deepening or an add-on or anything else that was missing that you would do different? Well, that's a good question. I uh, retired from the Body Electric School in 2003. Hmm. So I, I, I decided to devote my life to the formation of the Eastern Mountain community and Uh, as a as a as a daily activity, so I I no longer worked for the school. I was happy that the work continued in that workshop, and that occasionally we did that workshop at Easton Mountain over these years, and people would come, and in that context they would be told that I was the one who created the workshop, so then they would they would have some conversation usually. Uh, with me. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is so remarkable for me because it's so elusive. I've done things, I've painted a picture and there's a picture there. It's still there. I have helped create Easton Mountain. It's here. Hmm. This thing is so ephemeral and uh, like dust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did that, and probably it's the most famous thing I have ever done that had more influence than anything, and I am not going to be known for it, really. And if you put that on my tombstone, he invented the three-minute game, that's probably maybe one of the reasons why I was put on Earth, just to do that. <laughs> This is like I, my theory of relativity. Einstein did that, and then not... Uh, 
that was his supreme achievement. Maybe this is mine. And the rest of it is just uh, participating in life. Some things are so simple. If I say, what do you want me to do? And you say, I have no idea. Then we rest in that, that you have no idea until something occurs. So intimacy requires resting and being with each other. It, it requires training and people think that's ridiculous. We know how to have sex with each other. And when you interview people, you find out, yes, they do know how to have sex. And generally they're not satisfied, either one of them. They did this thing and they did what they usually do and they're not satisfied. They never get what they want. And then people complain and I don't believe them they complain and they say, I'm always the giver. I never get what I want. And I don't believe them because if they were always the giver, they wouldn't be complaining. Hmm. If I'm a giver, I'm a giver and I'm not complaining about it. I'm doing it because 100%, that's what I want to do. And you're not giving me anything back. I don't, that's not the point. I gave 100%. Hmm. If I want something back, then I have to ask. And we, what do we do? We want something to happen without having to ask for it. I wanted you to give me a rose on my birthday, but I didn't ask. And for 10 years, you've been giving me carnations. You were saying, I want you to be God and know who I am and what I want. Where all the shadows come into place and people's behavior to belong and uh, getting their needs met and expectations and pleasing and the entire shebang. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just want to give you a testimony that I had the most amazing breakthroughs through this um, three, four sessions that we had. So I was just blown away and the way how you helped me was just fantastic. So I'm very grateful for that. And I would like you to know as well that I have been breaking down the three minute game in a neurophysiological way through the polyvagal theory and somatic experience. So I have broken it down into trauma research and being trauma informed specifically for hands on practitioners and facilitator that they understand um, how important that is having agreements that are functional, having a container where an experience can happen that allows people to thrive and um, transform in. And it is simple. It, it, if, if you want to re, uh, refer to Jesus, he put his hands on somebody. That's all that so we know in hospitals, secretly nurses are going around touching people mm. and something's, something happens. Yeah. So this is the same way. I don't have to wait until I'm sick and dying to be touched. And if I have trauma as the wound, I'm coming like the blind man. He didn't, there was no conversation. Jesus knew he was blind and he didn't, he wanted to be see, he wanted to see. So trauma can be this, can, can be impacted by this. And the, the hard part about it is that in talking about it, we don't have to feel it. We don't have to feel the wounding of that trauma in talking about it, but in having somebody's hands on you, we have to feel it in our body. It's not complicated. There's nothing wrong with us. Our body is equipped to feel this and to transform it. Hmm. Hmm. Transform it is better word than letting it go, but there can be a moment when this, this is the ruler of our life and in the next moment where we are returned to the ruler of our lives. Mm. I believe that. Mm. I've seen it happen. I'm very, very grateful and um, really honored that you took the time and speaking about that depth and uh, really appreciate your, your depth. So do you have any last comment, message? What would you like people to know? Well, if, if people are interested, they that all they have to do is Google these things. And, you know, a year, a year or a year and a half ago, I didn't know you. And now I know you from a different part of the world. And we have this conversation. And these days, this is so possible. And it happens that we're doing this 
in the time of an epidemic. And this is one of the uh, benefits or effects, favorable effects of our being shut in. And I believe that when this is over, we are going to go about our work with a renewed enthusiasm. And my simple idea has been developed by Betty Martin and by you and, may, and by ISTA and other people are doing this. And then something else will be discovered to speak to uh, people and their needs if they are younger and different. So I'm happy to have been part of this process and thank you for including me. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm we meet someday face to face. I would love to travel again and come to New York and visit you there in Eastern Mountain. Yes. And, and yes. I might come and do a retreat there one day. I hope so. Yes. Um, okay, bless you. Bless you. Thank you very much. And I'm really grateful for you. Thank you very much, Harry. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.